And it's my pleasure to introduce the first speaker, um, which is Professor Hugh Durrant-White. And Hugh's one of the most distinguished data scientists, I guess you would call him, although he's probably at the intersection of a bunch of disciplines in the country. He's both a fellow of the Australian Academy of Science and a fellow of the Royal Society of the UK. He's been a center, uh, director of a center, ARC Centre of Excellence way back from 2002 to 2010. He was the director of the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence for Autonomous Systems. He was director of NICTA, which is a, a very big centre of excellence. He has been the chief scientific advisor to the UK Ministry of Defence, um, but he's now returned to Australia, or well, did in, in 2018, and he's now currently the New South Wales chief scientist and engineer. So I, I think... Um, we're very lucky to have someone with the uh, breadth of and depth of experience that Hugh's had to talk about um, the opportunities for data science and data science expertise and statistics and mathematical modeling um, in the sort of environment we've got at the moment. So welcome Hugh, and um, I invite you to, uh, to tell us a little bit about what you've got to say. Thanks Peter. Uh... I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, so that was what I was supposed to talk about, was it? Okay. <laughs> actually, you know, I thought very hard and I thought actually, you know, the most useful thing I could do is to, uh, you know, talk to the young career researchers and the students about, you know, um, the things that I did in my career and also, I guess, lessons from that around the way that one goes about uh, all of these sorts of problems. So I sort of subtitled here, it's a, it's a story a little bit about robotics, a little bit about data, but it's a lot about how I translate or how it's good to translate research into impact and I guess about uh, academic careers in general. And I've had a pretty varied career. Um, I started life actually as a nuclear engineer. Uh, it's a little known fact and I designed uh, or I was part of the team that designed uh, the reactor that went into that submarine that you see there. Um, so, uh, you know, I had a little bit of a taste of uh, engineering, a little bit of a taste of kind of uh, other things that one could do. And I also learned truthfully that this is what I didn't want to do in my career and decided very early on to give up that one and move on to a different career. And I also decided I wanted to travel. And so I kind of took the opportunity, firstly, of going to the US and secondly, to pick an area that I knew nothing about at all, which was robotics and computer science. Um, and I happened to luck out. Uh, this is actually the group that I worked with when I was there, when robotics was just standing out. And just for everyone's interest, we had a lab, and can you see that computer in the back of the lab? That's ENIAC. So that's the first digital computer ever in the world. And we happened to have it sitting in the back corner of our lab. Uh, it's where no one was really that interested in it. And we've all got pieces of it, incidentally, because we, we took different parts of it uh, to keep in our collections. So it was a really, really interesting experience. I changed career. I learned about things. Where it's always good to get into a field where, at that point, there had never really been a conference about robotics. Uh, and to go to the first conferences in robotics and to, to sort of start and develop that kind of thing. And in those days also, uh, we tried to, you know, I mean, I guess we were very naive, um, but we really tried to address what I would say now are impressively complex problems. So my PhD was actually about hand-eye coordination. Uh, and even now that would be considered a pretty challenging thing. So you can see here, we've got a set of stereo eyes and we've got a hand with a gripper with some sensors in. And my job was to basically fuse the data that came from the cameras and the information that came from uh, 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 this manipulator to try and understand uh, different types of objects. And just to give you an idea of how long ago this was, it used to take us four hours to process a single image on a VAX 11750. Uh, and the idea that you could ever do this in real time uh, was a complete uh, alien sort of thought uh, at the time. But it was one of the first times that people had ever tried to use probabilistic methods in, uh, uh, in robotics. Uh, and a little anecdote here, um, not this work, but a little piece later, I wrote a paper with a colleague about the use of Bayesian methods actually to, to do navigation. And I sent it to Ichikai, which is one of the top AI conferences, uh, and it was rejected. And it was rejected with the uh, review that basically said, probability has no role in AI. That shows you how long ago that was. Everyone was still using rule-based methods uh, to doing AI. So the other thing I did was having completed my PhD, I kind of gave up that career again. And I went into other areas. I 
uh, started to work on uh, ground vehicles or mobile robotics. There were very few mobile robotics people at that time. And again, trying to get into an area where there were still significant challenges. Uh, I built up a team uh, uh, at Oxford to kind of do this sort of stuff. And we did a lot of work on indoor robotics. And here's a little video of what robotics looked like in 1989. Uh, uh, this is a, uh, an interesting robot um, because, and we'll come back to it a bit later on, you'll notice that it's all made up of little bricks, little modules. And we were trying to build almost like a Lego kit for robots. And every little uh, block in this has a processor in and it has different sorts of data. It has uh, sensor data or it has wheel encoder data. And again, we use the kind of distributed form of Bayes theorem uh, to integrate all this information and to build very modular types of robots, all based essentially on sort of fairly basic statistical ideas uh, at that time. And then for me, a big change happened when I suddenly met a, bar, met a man in a bar. And uh, this is uh, no joke, we actually met in the pub. And he said, well, I like your robots, but could you do something a little bit bigger? And what he had in mind was automating a container terminal. It looked like this. And if you think about it, uh, this is not that hard a problem, at least conceptually, uh, because all you're really trying to do is to move boxes around from A to B. Uh, and you've got those navigation algorithms I've just showed you on the little robot. The only challenge is you have to build a much, much bigger robot, clearly, and it has to go much quicker. And I have to say, this was really my first introduction to how you translate research into a real hard world uh, application. And uh, it was a, quite a big challenge in, in those days. Again, you've got to think of where the computing power was at the time and also where our knowledge of autonomy was. Uh, so again, this was back in the late 80s, early 90s. And we set up a company and we built uh, a robot. And here it is. Uh, this is 992, so a long time ago. Uh, outdoor mobile robot, had 12 computers on. It had lots of different types of sensors, millimeter wave radar, lasers. Uh, it uh, basically ran a Kalman filter for its guidance algorithm. It had a statistical algorithm for taking the data from the radars and creating a, like a map of the environment. And this, again, came back into lots of other things. You can see the radar just down here at the front. And we genuinely built some quite sophisticated things. So for the fact, for example, the platform deforms when it's loaded, uh, meant that you had to build quite sophisticated models for what the platform was. And technically, this was a fantastic project. Uh, the problem was it commercially wasn't successful. And it wasn't successful because nobody was ready for robots in outdoor worlds like this. But we learned a lot of great and valuable lessons. And for me, at least, what I learned was I never really wanted to work inside a lab again. I wanted to build big outdoor robots. Oh, incidentally, this is, I should turn down the volume here a little bit. Uh, this is, um, uh, sorry, can you still hear me? Put your thumb up if you can, yep, so I'm not sure. Yeah, we can still so, hear you. So th this is a control, this is uh, an interesting thing, this shows you what goes wrong. We're, this is the first time we ever drove the vehicle backwards. Uh, so, and uh, I didn't have a driving license in those days, and I thought if you go backwards and you want to turn left, you would steer, turn the steering wheel to the right, which of course is not true. Uh, and you can see this guy here figuring out that there's something wrong with my algorithm at this point. <laughs> and trying to fix what's going on. So these are, again, experiences that you learn uh, as you go along with these things. So I wanted to build big robots, and that's why I came to Australia. Australia is big and empty and a long way from anywhere. Frankly, it's the perfect place to build large outdoor robots, uh, particularly at a time where, frankly, no one else was doing it. Uh, there was enormous opportunities, commercial opportunities, research opportunities. It's a big and complicated place out there and an opportunity to really change things and do things differently. And uh, I realized early on that it was possible to really do something quite different. So I built a group, uh, the Australian Centre for Field Robotics, and we basically worked on uh, lots of things outside. So air platforms, again, this was back in the early 90s. Uh, before people were really doing UAVs in mining applications. Incidentally, we also built the new cranes on the Sydney Harbour Bridge and a number of other kind of projects uh, uh, like that as well. And uh, we built a fantastic team. And I just thought I'd show you some of the kinds of developments of stuff uh, that we did uh, as we went along. So perhaps one of the most important projects we did was to automate the container terminals uh, in Australia. And it's interesting, these projects, because you saw I'd already done one of these projects in the UK, to be able to 
to do a project for the second time means that you can get all the things that you got wrong last time right this time. So the challenges around understanding, for example, when and how vehicles fail and how you statistically account for that and how you build robust and reliable decision making processes and so on. And so I managed to convince Chris Corrigan, who wanted anyway to automate the container terminals, uh, to invest in a research program at the university. We got ourselves a basic straddle carrier. Uh, this was during the waterfront dispute back in 1997. So we ran it out of the test facility in Western Sydney, all the way through to the first prototypes, to operational testing, to the automated terminals that now exist in Brisbane, uh, in Long Beach in California, and here in Port Botany uh, are all basically outcomes from this. And this gives you an idea of what we basically did. This is a, uh, a robot straddle carrier. Um, this is actually at Port Botany. There are 36 of these on Port Botany. There are, I think, 70 of them at Long Beach. There are 18 of them thing. Uh, it uses a, a more updatable Kalman filter for a core navigation algorithm. So it's essentially a statistical parameter estimation problem in terms of uh, where this thing goes. Again, it's got the same sort of radar than whether you can see on the top of this vehicle that I showed you in the earlier vehicle. It also uses some quite sophisticated sensing, lasers and things at the bottom uh, in order to actually be able to detect and locate and pick up and put down uh, containers. And uh, the Port of Brisbane, for example, is actually controlled from a room now in, uh, in, uh, in Port Botany. So this is truly autonomous, been running now for 13 years. Um, so it's arguably these days one of the most uh, sophisticated commercial in use uh, field robotic systems uh, anywhere in the world. Um, and their core kind of algorithms. And this was really a great project for everyone at the University of Sydney to see the work being translated and to be used. So great project. I just thought I'd go into one little technical detail. One of the biggest problems we had to solve actually uh, for the straddle carrier was how to make uh, guarantees that actually, uh, if things went wrong, that they would actually be detectable. Um, so for example, it's usually not a hardware failure where things go wrong. So it's not a you know, piece of uh, computing or a sensor that goes wrong. Usually what's wrong is that when you interpret the data, say from the radar or from the lasers, you actually interpret it incorrectly because you uh, might not have seen that information before. And uh, the challenge with that is really trying to understand when things have gone wrong. And the way we actually did that in the end is we used an information filter. So this is kind of the inverse covariance form of the Kalman filter. And we use that to basically come up with two quite different and quite separate estimates for what's going on in the, in the straddle carrier in real time, so 20 times a second. And then we basically use the information filter and we compare different values and different amounts of information, effectively the mutual information in each of those two control loops, and use that if there was significant variance to detect a failure regardless of what's going on in the, in the vehicle or model itself. And this was a kind of core piece of IP that allowed us to basically build systems which were of the integrity. And when you've got an unmanned vehicle doing 60 kilometers an hour uh, and weighing you know, 80 tons, you've got to make some guarantees about the fact that it won't go through fences or it won't go into containers or kill someone because that's the first time they'll actually switch it off. So it managed to do uh, that kind of uh, uh, thing. And equally, we also learned a lot about the business of doing things like this. So, you know, we always thought that you could make a business out of selling autonomous components or even autonomous straddle carriers. But we learned very early on that actually the big value in automation is not automation per se, it's actually in changing the way that businesses run. So, you know, uh, the students in my group who bought Patrick uh, shares uh, when Patrick's was only valued at $200 million, uh, and Patrick's uh, three or four years ago now was sold for $13 billion. So a 30 fold increase in value for the company, largely on the back of its productivity uh, out of automation, shows you the value that you can get out of this uh, sort of technology. So again, a really, really interesting project. And again, uh, one of the things I most enjoyed about it was being able to take relatively sophisticated ideas in robotics and data science and actually see the impact of that and follow that impact through and really see it actually make a difference. So lots of other types of technology, I won't go into that, come there. So the other big thing that I came to Australia to do originally was to try and work in mining, because mining is a kind of obvious place to do automation. Again, 
lots of remote sites, uh, lots of big equipment moving around, uh, very, very expensive, capital intensive. It's the kind of obvious place to try and do uh, uh, automation. This is incidentally a picture of Tom Price uh, back in 1996 uh, when I first visited there. And I will say I had lots of kind of work that we got on with. Um, we tried early on in 1996 to automate trucks. So this is a automated truck. You'll see again the same radar. So we use very similar technology across all different applications. This is actually a test of the collision detection system. So you can see this person here is acting as the target. Uh, and this is trying to, you know, the truck has uh, got to stop for the person, but it's not supposed to stop for things like kangaroos. This is another example project that we worked on trying to automate one of these uh, vehicles, so-called load haul dump vehicles uh, in an underground mine. This is actually a Mount Isa. So again, back in 1996, and we equipped it with lots of sensors and we used those sensors to map out the walls. And then we used models of those walls to guide the vehicle uh, down the trajectory and so on. And it was an interesting process. So we tried to map all our technology from the sort of straddle carry areas and our algorithms, Kalman filter, Bayesian estimation techniques, mapping techniques to this application. And the problem was we didn't actually get anyone interested in mining automation. And um, you can see we built lots of different sensor technologies. You can see we're putting sensors on trucks. We had a company that did this. Uh, we had another company that built radars that you put in stopes, we put into trucks and so on. But nobody was really interested in automation. And what we learned as we went along was that actually no one was interested in automated truck. Rather, what they were really interested in, like I showed you the container terminal, was actually an automated mine. And it wasn't until much later when uh, we convinced Rio Tinto to invest in uh, this sort of thing. But, you know, there's a kind of story actually to this. Uh, Back in 2006, when I was still trying to get mining automation going, we actually took the Rio Tinto executives to the automated container terminal in Brisbane. And when we took them there, it was interesting because unlike me, they didn't see an automated straddle carrier, which I was interested in. What they saw was an automated container terminal. And what they also saw was the productivity change in the terminal and the different ways the terminal operated. And when they saw that, within one month, they'd given the University of Sydney $25 million to start the process of automating a mine. And interestingly, because we'd spent 10 years trying to sell them automated trucks, and they weren't actually interested in that. They were interested actually in the whole mine automation process. And so we started a huge project, um, which now has had something close to 2 billion invested in it, uh, to do not just automated equipment, but to do the whole data fusion piece for mining, to set up the whole data fusion architecture, et cetera, et cetera. And it, uh, this whole program, as I'll come to in a minute, has absolutely transformed uh, the mining industry uh, in this country. So we kicked out early on. Uh, the very first thing we did was actually to design a new computer architecture, uh, which would uh, provide all the tools uh, to automate a mine. And, by, and we call it the mine automation system. It's still called the mine automation system. And it had plug-in modules for things like uh, drills and trucks and different types of sensor technologies, hyperspectral, uh, uh, truck uh, vehicles that went around and did surveying. It also had pieces to link into, for example, the geological models. These are block models that they use uh, for describing what's going on in the mine. And it kind of provided a central place where all that information could come together. These days, if you were to re-implement this, you'd use a cloud computing system. But it, interestingly, back in 2006, seven, there weren't such things. And so we actually had to design most of the architecture ourselves from scratch. And I think for this group here, we actually started a different direction. We didn't start with the trucks. We actually started with the data fusion system for the mine. So we, we convinced Rio Tinto that what they really wanted was a system that would take all the information that they collected across the mine from hyperspectral imaging, from uh, drill hole logs to 3D laser scans to acoustic imaging and everything else. And in real time, build up a fused picture for what was going on in the mine. So what we'd think of as uh, not just equipment disposition, but the uh, two and a half D model of what the surface of the mine looks like, the 3D model for what the iron ore distribution and contaminant distributions would look like, a 4D model for what's actually going on with the ore body itself and how it's mined. And we'd put this into a common sort of data fusion engine. And as you would expect, it's all a big Bayesian engine. And in fact, not to give the game away too much, it's all based in fact on Gaussian processes. So that's how we basically model all your bodies and things like that. 
And we use this whole process to basically build in real time a model for what goes on in the mine. And to this day, this is exactly the algorithms and the architecture that Rio Tinto use for modeling the benches uh, and the ore models that they have, not just in iron ore, but in copper and in all the other areas that they have. So it's underpinned by these large Bayesian uh, models for pulling all the information uh, together. And yes, we did automate equipment, but I have to say, and this is the kind of change in lesson that we had from uh, where we were with the ports, a lot of the automation follows the data and the data uh, fusion part of what we actually did. So pulling together the geology model, pulling together an outer ground model, understanding how that material flows through the mine, onto trains, onto other types of operation. So just to give you a feeling for this, this is the automated drill. This, is, this video is now over a decade old, so it shows you how long this system's been in production. We ran, uh, built a system that did automatic drilling. As you drill, it automatically builds up using a Gaussian process, a model for what the terrain looks like underneath, and it uses that information for guiding future drilling and also guiding uh, what information there is about grade. So you can see this top left-hand picture here. Can you see the real-time grade picture? So that's a kind of key piece that goes on. There you can see the grade picture up at the top. And we use that for basically understanding how to better mine and how, better, how to better run uh, the operations. So that was the drilling part. And this is the truck part. So this is basically the straddle carrier technology repurposed for very large haul trucks. These are extraordinarily big trucks. When they're fully laden, they weigh about 600 tons. All right, so this is not a trivial machine. And to be able to operate these and uh, use them in productivity to understand how that material flows through the mine was kind of crucial. And then further down, uh, some of you may know if you're out in Western Australia, there's a huge facility near the airport in uh, Perth, which basically allows Rio Tinto to run not just one of the mines in, in the Pilbara, but all of the Pilbara, and in fact, all the different mines across the globe from a single operations center, all right? using essentially all those data fusion methods, all those remote control things and so on. And Rio pioneered this, but many of the big mining companies, in fact, all of them now have got similar sorts of operations. Although in my personal view, I think they still need to learn something about Bayesian statistics uh, so that they know how to use the data properly uh, when they're doing this. So again, this is a kind of process of taking those core algorithms and core ideas and genuinely working with companies to deliver something which is, uh, changing for the whole industry and that truly creates this kind of level of value and i i will say one of my messages today is the kind of work that asim's involved in has the capacity to do this kind of change in these sorts of industries so i might go all the way back to the beginning again and just give you one other example so you may recall that little modular robot i showed you at the beginning well we genuinely tried to show that without any change in the code you could actually assemble robots of different sizes and different configurations with every module containing different types of sensors and so on. And if you wanna know how it works, this is again technology back in the 1990s. Essentially what happens is we use, um, you know, uh, log of the Bayes theorem, all right? Log of Bayes theorem, the big advantage is you can just add it up. Um, so uh, if you are in Kalman filter land, this just turns into an information filter and we stick an information filter at each of the different nodes and we have these things called channel filters, which are really the difference in information that's gained at each of the nodes. And by doing this, you can kind of create a network of fusion centers without there being any central place in which you put the information together. And because of the way, you know, the posterior and Bayes theorem adds up, you can actually distribute the calculation anywhere in this network. And we showed this back in the 1990s that you could run it on little robots like this, but we actually had no more interest for quite a little while until one day uh, BAE Systems, a big defense company came to us and said, well, could you do this on a larger network of robots rather than one robot? And again, they gave us a very large amount of money. And I have to say we were, we props bit off more than we could chew in this case. And we built a fleet of this, I have to say is back in the, uh, late 1990s. So this kind of gives you, this is a, a world in which we do not have the kind of drone technology that exists today. And we built uh, a fleet of UAVs. And you see these funny noses in the UAVs. Each of these noses you can see has a different sensor in it. And every sensor has its own computer and its own Wi-Fi. And so each of the sensors in each of the aircraft network together. 
And the idea was to demonstrate that in flight, we didn't need any central fusion place. We could actually assemble that information on any flight platform anywhere in real time. And we took this and we built a flight test facility. So this was non-trivial. And we actually demonstrated this technology. So this is a very complex experiment. We have only one pilot and we have four aircraft. Uh, so what we do is we launch the aircraft one by one. And these are not trivial airplanes either. So they cost of order half a million dollars each when they've got sensors in them. And we have crashed a few. Uh, we did crash a few. The project's long finished now. And then uh, you'll see as they get into the air, um, they start, they fly in pretty close proximity. They're basically using the sensors to build a map of different types of targets on the ground. You'll see this in a minute. I apologize for the thing. So you can see that for the trajectories here, uh, there are various targets you can see that are numbered on the ground. And then you can see they sweep through and they actually pick up different target types. So each of these is essentially running a, uh, a Bayesian filter. And when they're in communication, they can basically communicate the posterior to each other. And they can take that posterior and fuse it with their own local posterior. And on the back of that, they can basically build up a complete map of what's going on on the ground. Right, And this gives you an idea of the two red things here. This is a management video, not a technical video. It gives you some idea of what part or how much of the posterior is contained in each of the different flight vehicles. So it was a vivid demonstration in a defense context of the sorts of use of a federated distributed uh, Bayesian estimation algorithm. So again, this was a really exciting project to run at a university. This was in the years when, long way before people were really doing this kind of stuff uh, 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 on drones and so on. And so, but the big advantage was actually being able to translate this. So we had great success in translating this into BAE Systems products. So the Type 45 Air Defense Destroyer, which sits down here, which was uh, being designed at that time, actually runs a federated form of Bayesian filtering, uh, which took a lot of the algorithms that I was showing you there and now use it for and uses it for basically uh, tracking uh, aircraft and missiles and things like that in a multiple ship configuration. The flight control algorithms that we developed now sit on this Raven aircraft and some of the later unmanned combat aircraft that BAE Systems developed. And we also mapped it into a US project called MAST, Micro Autonomous Systems Technology, that actually mapped Bayesian algorithms onto very small uh, platforms uh, that went around a mobile environment. So lots of really interesting outcomes from that project. This is also one that we did in Australia. This is now quite a successful company, Marathon Targets. It basically builds robots for defense applications. In this case, the robots are just targets. So this is a shooting range and it allows robots to run around, communicate information and be shot at so that people can basically train to be things like snipers. Uh, Lots of other exciting projects we worked on. So we did a lot of work in agriculture. Again, lots of statistical estimation types of problems. Uh, building the, here, let's see whether this goes. Yep, so this is a work of some of my colleagues building agricultural robots. There's now uh, quite a significant company that's been built on the back of this, doing estimation of weeds, uh, weed cropping, uh, precision agriculture, and these sorts of things. Uh, we also worked a lot in underwater domains, again, uh, work of my colleague Stefan Williams. This is work that's actually done for IMOS, the Integrated Marine Observing System. Again, it's a big data fusion problem, you know, figuring out where the platform is, what it's looking at, uh, trying to build significant maps for what's going on, combining it with other uh, information and so on. And we also worked, uh, interestingly, on uh, media art. So this was uh, uh, an art uh, exhibit that was basically about two wheelchairs uh, collaborating with each other and exchanging love messages with each other. I won't go into details about that. So we had a good time, huge amount of fun. And for the young career researchers there, I also decided that I'd done enough robotics and I decided it was time to move on and let the younger people have a go at doing it. And so I actually moved out of robotics. This was about 10 years ago now. And uh, as Peter said, I decided to go and run NICTA. And NICTA is interesting because it does everything, it did everything except robotics. It did. Uh, uh, lots of machine learning, we did lots of geology, it did lots of things around uh, pipes, it did lots of things about recommendation engines, huge amounts of opportunities for applying machine learning and AI uh, in different types of contexts. And I learned a huge amount about lots of other different fields. 
Uh, I also learned about trying to generate lots of new startup companies. So in the time I was at NICTA, we actually created 18 startup companies. And I'm pleased to say five of them are now worth over a billion dollars uh, on the ASX. So it was a really profitable time in terms of converting ideas into new things in lots of different ways. So if I pick out companies here, uh, companies like Nitero, uh, invent, you know, invented the 60 gig Wi-Fi, uh, Ordinate became a, a, a uh, um, an ASX listed audio company, Saluda Medical is about medical implants, whole ranges of different technologies. And I had a great time learning about lots of new technologies and about all the opportunities that are out there, not just in the data field, but in the broad computing science field. And I will say, I learned a lot about politics as well. Uh, and the fact that I actually don't like politics, it has to be said. So here, I, here am I with lots of different past prime ministers, and they certainly went through at a very speedy pace in the time that I was on NICTA, and it made it very, very challenging to try and get innovation accepted as part of the sorts of things that we need to be doing in this country to create the kinds of outputs uh, that I've been talking about. But I learned a lot of good lessons, and it was interesting for me. And then, as Peter said, I uh, tried something else again, and I, I want to emphasize to the young career people there, I think it's really, really good um, to change careers on a reasonably regular basis. Uh, and particularly to try and get into areas that nobody else is working in and to try and do things that are very, very different from what people are currently doing. And I had five good years at NICTA, but I also got to the point, I think, of uh, the, the fact that I really had to move on and try something else. And so I actually went to the UK, uh, much to my wife's annoyance because she stayed in Australia, uh, <laughs> uh, and really tried something completely different. I took on the role of being chief scientist for the Ministry of Defence. And chief scientist of the Ministry of Defense is very different from what Tanya and what Alex uh, Zielinski are though here, because you actually sit in Whitehall and you make decisions uh, with all the admirals about what they're actually going to buy. So, for example, I signed the purchase order for this aircraft carrier. OK, uh, I did it, of course, with lots of evidence and so on and so forth. And I clearly could not exactly say no, because all the admirals wanted one. Uh, but nevertheless, it was an interesting experience trying to understand what people thought about what different things. And particularly there, I really tried to push hard on the fact that we should be buying few of these aircraft carriers and many more of these autonomous vehicles and effects and computer-based uh, systems and so on. Because defense these days is a lot more about computer science than it is about metalwork. Uh, that's what we learn in these sorts of things. And I drove a significant program to actually transfer a lot of UK defence spending away from buying things like that into areas like information, so autonomous systems, cyber, ISR, information, data fusion, and also things like skills, how we simulate what we should be doing, how we talk about how we're going to augment people, both in skills and training and things like that. And again, away from the sort of more conventional what we think about defence. And I don't know whether people have ever watched the news, but you might have seen an announcement re recently, the UK is no longer going to buy tanks anymore, for example. And it's no longer going to invest in big aircraft that don't have an unmanned option and all of these sorts of things. And there is a change coming in the way that we try and do defence to things that are about deterrence and about information much more than they are about conventional kinds of uh, warfare. And I think that is uh, a positive move. So I learned a huge amount doing that uh, sort of thing. Uh, and I came back to New South Wales and I swapped aircraft carriers for koalas and uh, missiles for traffic problems. Um, but I have to say again, it's been an interesting experience. My wife is pleased to have me back uh, firstly, but I learned a number of things. I learned about the way that actually the UK do science and technology very differently from the way that we currently do science and technology. In particular, scientists, and by that I mean Peter and myself and everyone who's around uh, who does really, really great research, is very engaged with government. There is no government department in the UK that does not have a chief scientist. And people in the academy, the Royal Society, the first thing they show you when you go to the academy is a list of all the people or pictures of all the people who are embedded in government making decisions as scientists. And that's the kind of thing that we are still lacking in this country where government genuinely listens to what's going on in science and genuinely thinks carefully about innovation policy. And I often wave around the, the uh, 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 announcement that came out in February. UK government is proposing to spend £22 billion a year on universities and research. 
the total figure in this country is less than two. All right, we are just miles away from where we need to be in this country if we genuinely think innovation is important. And I will say part of that is our fault because we do not talk to the government enough about the sorts of things that I've been showing you here, where science genuinely has an impact and a commercial outcome, a prosperity agenda on the environment in which we work. And so I encourage you as young researchers uh, and graduate students to think carefully, not just about the science and the papers you publish, but about the impact that you can have and the prosperity that this country uh, can have out of the work that you actually do. So I won't go into details, but frankly, I spend a lot of my time now uh, talking with government about how they can make investments in industry, how they can support precincts, how they can support universities, how they can attract uh, these sorts of things and to genuinely change the way that they think about what's going on uh, in our state, but also in the country as a whole. So let me leave you with a few words, We've probably spent long enough. I think um, look to your leadership in the sense of inspiration for doing something different. And also the fact that in your careers, if you're not moving around every 10 years, then you're probably not doing enough moving, if you see what I mean. And I think academics should move around and try and find fields and occupations which are still open and fallow. I think the other thing that's important to point out is teams. And you are having the retreat today, and I think that's very, very important, is nothing ever happens by individuals alone. Uh, and building a good team and solving hard problems and doing exciting stuff is really, really important. And finally, to repeat what I've been saying, it's about impact. Uh, in the end, when I look back and I try and think what has been nice and useful and that I've most enjoyed in my career, it's the fact that I can walk around and point at all the impact and point at all the things that people have done with the research that I have produced. So thank you very much. I might stop there. Thank you very much, Hugh. That was, that was amazing. And, um, and I think it was a great way to start off our retreat. So. Um, we don't have a super amount of time for questions, but I, I do want to give anyone um, out there who wants to ask quick questions of you the opportunity. Um, we've got a 10 minute break, so let's move a little bit into that. If anyone really needs to, to leave, then feel free. I'm going to use the raised hand um, thing in, um, on the, uh, so if you want to ask a question, please raise your hand. And I see Bay Ruth from the University of Melbourne has. So Bay Ruth, do you want to ask a question? Yes, so uh, thanks Hugh. I had a question, so if you were to add a scientist to some department in a government agency in Australia, Commonwealth level or, fed or local level, what would it be, just one place? You would think? So I didn't quite get the question, what, what thing so is a scientist in government? If you were to add, like in the UK, if you were to add oh, one see. scientist then. So I think, I, think, I think actually, truthfully, the, what, what happened in the UK, and I, you know, I, I guess back in 19, when I left the UK, the UK looked a lot, uh, like in 95, the UK looked a lot like Australia does now. People didn't really, you know, people went to universities and people went to industry and government and the two sides didn't really communicate. And I think what changed over the interim was that I guess universities had to do what we're doing now. They were running out of funding models uh, and uh, eventually they got together with government and said, actually, we can help you. You know, it turns out we can make better decisions about, you know, uh, about, uh, everything uh, in industry and, and so on than you can by yourself. So actually one of the things that happened when I was there was uh, they developed uh, an AI strategy. And instead of what we do here, so a, a, a cola, for example, you know, wrote a great piece on AI, if you remember, a couple of years ago, and we went away, they got all the academics together and we wrote this great report. And at the end of it, we produced the report, and we handed it over to government and nothing happened. In the UK, what happened is the people, the academy and government got together decided what they were going to do in AI, then worked together on the report. And the day the report was issued, they got 250 million pounds in funding. Do you see what I mean? So, and a lot of it was about working on the impacts of AI and working with companies on how they could exploit AI and working on pathways for academics to engage in AI. I mean, the Turing Institute was an outcome of this, right? You know, where genuinely there is this level of collaboration. It's not a and we still don't seem to have that dynamic. So my biggest role when I'm in the state government here is actually connecting academics to problems and also generating new funding that allows those academics to work uh, on those sorts of problems, whether it be in government or whether it be for companies. And Louise will know this because she actually is employed some of the time by my office to kind of make those connections. <laughs> 
So thanks, Hugh. I see another one from Mark Lawrence. Um, hello, Hugh. Uh, thank you very much for this amazing talk. Um, I, by the way, was a contributor to that Ecola report a couple of years ago, and I agree it was incredibly disappointing that essentially nothing happened. Um, one of the amazing themes from your talk is just how frequently you moved into new and exciting and open areas. Um, I think for many people listening, it's not obvious how to do that. And I'm wondering if you have any advice. If you've trained in a particular area and you're interested in moving, how do you, go, how do you think about moving? What's the strategy? How do you make that happen? Thank you. Well, I, I will say, I think academia has changed since I was young, all right? Uh, you know, um, we, no one in my generation knew anything, knew even what a citation was, uh, I think. You know, uh, it was just an alien thing. So there was very much a, a, a thrust in the Oxford lab, which was run by a great guy called Mike Brady, to just go out and do really cool, interesting stuff. Do you know what I mean? Um, and so, you know, when I try and advise my, when I was still in academia, I still, I'm still on leave effectively. Uh, I say to people, don't worry about citations. Don't worry that much about publications, but go and do something that's really exciting. That's really cool. Uh, it doesn't matter what it is. Solve a problem. You know what I mean? And all of the rest will follow. So, and, and, and sometimes I like to try and give the example, I mean, you know, uh, of, you know, you know, how I'm sure the senior people here will know if you write a letter for an American academic getting tenure, you actually are asked to compare what they've done relative to their peers. And you would say their contribution, what exciting things and so on and so forth. Whereas here we've got a mentality of how many papers and how many citations has that person got. And I think, we, I think you know, so for you as leaders, uh, uh, Mark and Peter, you need to be saying to your, your juniors, don't worry about that. I forgive you. All right. But find a really, really cool and interesting problem that's really hard that you're really interested in and go after it. Do you know what I mean? And I will give you two or three years. You're in a center of excellence to do it. Uh, and I think that's what you need to be doing. Thank you. Thanks, Hugh. A um, couple more quick questions, if anyone's interested. Just put your hand up in the um, participants. That's it. Maybe I'll ask one then, Hugh. Oh, Mark, you've got your hand up again. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Just a, a quick follow-up. I mean, in terms of all of your work at NICTA and with AI, <clears throat> um, some of the current areas that are pretty hot in AI include things like explainability. <clears throat> That's a big one in, in uh, banking and finance, for example. And I'm just wondering if you're still working uh, in that whole AI domain and what you think about um, the current sort of progress and activity uh, in that fairly hot area. Um. So yes, I am. You know, I work. I work a day. I still actually. I work a day a week for React Inco, uh, and actually, I run their machine learning programs. Um, having said that, I am a by religion. I'm a Bayesian. Um, you know, and Bayes' theorem, in my view, has explainability built into it. You know, and uh, the biggest thing that I, you know, uh, but you'll hear this from other people, right? Is and I've given talks at a, at ASIMS at UNSW, for example. I work a lot on geology. Uh, you know, so areas where basically there are uh, large physical models, you know, uh, and where you basically have relatively sparse information. So they're not big data problems in that sense. And what you really want to produce is some sample model over the uh, sample over the models. OK, so which models best explain the data, whether it's a geological model, whether it's a process control system and, and that sort of thing. And that drives a different kind of sort of a piece where you want to be able to you know, very, as much as you possibly can exploit uh, information about, you know, prior knowledge about geology or physics models about material flow. And you want to be able to have that in your prior and use likelihood models to constrain uh, the way that you interpret that prior information. And I think that's the way AI should go. Mm. All right. I think this, I mean, you know, uh, again, back when I was a young lad, uh, we had a picture on the wall which basically was a little squiggle and the squiggle was annotated at the start with perceptrons, neural networks going around in loops. And I think we're still on that journey. Mm. You know, I think we will get off deep learning because I don't think it's an answer. Uh, and I think we will go back to really seeing that this is just applied statistics. Mm. <laughs> okay. Um, just very quickly, because I know we've got time, but Louise Ryan's put a question on uh, the chat saying those kinds of meta models are great in principle, but they can, 
be a bare computation. Do you have any advice on that? Uh, hang on. Where was that? Oh, it's in the chat. Meta models so are great in principle. Computational, but... yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, look, I mean, uh, we do, we do, I mean, you know, I shall stick with the geology example. You know, uh, we have fairly good models and, and uh, our geologists do of the way stratigraphy works, the way layering works, uh, and in fact, uh, the way that they interpret the different types of parts of those things. And, and those, those models, yes, they can be computational intensive, but you don't need to run the full computational model. I mean, in some sense, in an information model, you've got a computational model and you've got data. And if you had perfect data, you'd need no model. And if you have perfect models, you'd need no data. And it's a question of weighing those two things up and indeed, you know, putting a budget on your next uh, sensor foray with, you know, with the exploration group or putting more money into basically building models. And I think those sorts of principles apply in a lot of different areas. So I won't go to too many examples, a bit short of time here, but I think uh, there are lots of, I mean, in fact, there is a big research group at the Turing Institute called data centric engineering. I don't know whether anyone's come across that, which genuinely is trying to explore, you know, how those, uh, you know, physics-based models and data models come together in areas like fluids, uh, you know, structures and all those sorts of areas. And I think that's a, a very profitable and future area uh, for data science as a whole. Well, thanks, Hugh. That's no probably um, a good place to stop. Well, it would be good to go on, but we do have another... We have our yeah. industry panel starting at, at 1.30. Hugh, you're welcome to stay and listen if you're interested, but I realise that you're a busy person. But yeah. um, on behalf of ASIMS, I think that talk was just the best way to start off the retreat. I'm sure it's given Good. all our early career researchers and students a lot of ideas. And, and, and I have to say, I didn't know parts of your story. I knew some of it. And I thought, um, I found it incredibly inspiring. And thinking, oh, you know, maybe I should have gone a different way back in the old days. But There's certainly... still time, Peter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe. But thank you very much. And um, okay. I know um, we'll have applause across Zoom for the whole thing. It was a great, great talk. Thank okay. You. Thank you very much for inviting me, Peter. Cheers. Bye.